Good morning. morning. Welcome to worship at beautiful Savior Evangelical Lutheran Church. Today, as our Savior shows us how earnestly he desires his people to come to him and be saved, we recognize also his blessed promise that wherever two or three come together in his name, he is truly there with us. This morning we follow the order of service that you can find in your bulletin. It is uh, the, the common service, but slightly adjusted. And we begin with our opening hymn. <coughs> Please rise. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If, if we, we confess, confess our, our sins, sins, God is faithful and just, and will forgive us our sins, sins and purify and us from all unrighteousness. unrighteousness. Let us confess our sins to the Lord. Holy God, gracious Father, I am sinful by nature and have sinned against you in my thoughts, words, and actions. I have not loved you with my whole heart. I have not loved others as I should. I deserve your punishment both now and forever. But Jesus, my Savior, paid for my sins with his innocent suffering and death. Trusting in him, I pray, God, have mercy on me. Okay. 
our gracious Father in heaven has been merciful to us. He sent his only Son, Jesus Christ, who gave his life as the atoning sacrifice for the sins of the whole world. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ and by his authority, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the Church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For this holy house, and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Grant us, Lord, the spirit to think and do what is right, that we, who cannot do anything that is good without you, may by your help be enabled to live according to your will. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated. <clears throat> Our first lesson from Exodus chapter 20. Then God spoke all these words. I am the Lord, your God, who brought you out from the land of Egypt where you were slaves. You shall have no other gods beside me. You shall not make any carved image for yourself or any likeness of anything in heaven above or on earth below or in the waters underneath the earth. Do not bow down to them or be subservient to them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God. I follow up on the guilt of the fathers with their children, their grandchildren, and their great-grandchildren, if they also hate me. But I show mercy to thousands who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will not permit anyone who misuses his name to escape unpunished. Remember the Sabbath day by setting it apart as holy, Six days you are to serve and do all your regular work, but the seventh day shall be a Sabbath rest to the Lord your God. Do not do any regular work, neither you nor your sons or daughters, nor your male or female servants, nor your cattle, nor the alien who is residing inside your gates. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and everything that is in them, but he rested on the seventh day. In this way the Lord blessed the seventh day and made it holy. Honor your father and mother so that, it may, that you may spend many days in the land the Lord your God has given you. You shall not commit murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife, his male servant, his female servant, his ox, his donkey, or anything else that belongs to your neighbor. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We join now in singing our psalm of the day, Psalm 19, that you can find in your service folder.
second lesson from 1 Corinthians chapter 1. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. In fact, it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and the intelligence of the intelligent I will bring to nothing. Where is the wise man? Where is the expert in the Jewish law? Where is the probing thinker of the present age? Has God not shown that the wisdom of this world is foolish? Indeed, since the world through its wisdom did not know God, God in his wisdom decided to save those who believe through the foolishness of the preached message. Yes, Jews ask for signs, Greeks desire wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified which is offensive to Jews and foolishness to Greeks. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of God. We preach Christ crucified because the foolishness of God is wiser than men and the weakness of God is stronger than men. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please rise as we prepare to hear the gospel. Glory, praise, and honor to you, Lord Jesus Christ. His disciples remembered that it is written, Zeal for your house will consume me. The Holy Gospel of John, chapter 2. The Jewish Passover was near, so Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple courts he found people selling cattle, sheep, and doves, and money changers sitting at tables. He made a whip out of cords and drove everyone out of the temple courts along with the sheep and the oxen. He scattered the coins of money of the money changers and overturned their tables. To those selling doves, he said, Get these things out of here. Stop turning my father's house into a place of wisdom or a place of business. His disciples remembered that it was written, Zeal for your house will consume me. So the Jews responded, What sign are you going to show us to prove you can do these things? Jesus answered them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up again. The Jews said, It took 46 years to build this temple, and you are going to raise it in three days? But Jesus was speaking about the temple of his body. When Jesus was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this. Then they believed the scripture and what Jesus had said. This is the gospel of the Lord. We join now in confessing our common faith with the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation he came down from heaven, was incarnate with the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became truly human. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended to heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who in unity with the Father and the Son is worshiped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism, for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. You may be seated as we sing our hymn of the day. Note, we will sing the first five verses of hymn 558.
Please rise. May the God of hope fill you with complete joy and peace as you continue to believe so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Here again, words written for us in Exodus chapter 20. Then God spoke all these words. I am the Lord your God who brought you out from the land of Egypt where you were slaves. You may be seated. In 2011, Chip Kelly and his fast-paced offense brought a national championship to Oregon. Unfortunately, to the wrong university and the wrong city. Now, at that time, I couldn't have found Corvallis or Eugene on a map, but my seven-year-old nephew was just starting to watch and understand football with his father. And he saw those flashy uniforms, he watched those exciting games, and even though his dad has a large section of a Badger, a Wisconsin Badger basketball court sitting in his basement, that Wisconsin boy became a Ducks fan. A year later, the Seattle Seahawks drafted Russell Wilson, a former Badger quarterback, and he led them to the playoffs and then to two back-to-back Super Bowls. And so that young boy, living in the midst of all those cheeseheads and those hopeless Vikings fans that inhabit Eau Claire, Wisconsin, he became a Seahawks fan. It's very strange. And yet, no one really cared. You see, it's weird, but you don't really care who someone else cheers for. Unless they become a Yankees fan, there's not really a wrong decision to make. It doesn't matter if you are cheering for the Niners or the Chiefs. That doesn't make you a better person. Or if you are just hoping that the Vikings will someday win a Super Bowl before you die. Whatever team you follow, we know that's okay. In fact, you don't need to follow any team. It doesn't matter. There's many people who view religion in the same way. That you're just picking your team. And however you decide to pick your team, that's perfectly fine. If you're a warrior, maybe you're drawn to Thor and Odin and those big bushy beards and the dream of Valhalla. Maybe there's some philosophy in some religion that just really draws you in. But since religion's just to teach you how to live a good life, how to get to God, what does it really matter? You don't even need a religion. You can find your connection to your family and your traditions and your community in some other way. As long as you live your life, as long as you try to be good, well, what does it really matter? You better believe it mattered at the foot of Mount Sinai. Because God came down to the Israelites And that's the one thing that makes Christianity, the religion of the Bible, so different from all other religions in the world because God comes down and he intervenes with real people in real history, in real time. You might think, well, unlike all other philosophies and gods, the people form those around themselves. But here... God forms a people around himself. And he still does it today. It still matters because the Lord is your God. Every so-called God of Egypt was powerless. The Nile, blood, livestock, diseased and dying, the sun darkened. Even the gods of life and death could not withstand him. Do we fully appreciate how terrifying that was? Nature was under his command and will. He commanded frogs and lice and flies and locusts. He sent hail. He afflicted the body. He blacked out the sun. No power on earth even today can, can control the weather. And yet God did it like it was nothing. 
No power on earth can stop him. No power in the heavens. The magicians called on the power of the devil and his demons, and yet they were a poor imitation of what the Lord God could do. They could not withstand him. They couldn't slow him down. The gods of Egypt presided over one of the greatest civilizations in the ancient world for nearly a thousand years. And then this one God, the Lord, swept them aside like they were nothing. They were nothing. How terrifying. Except for the Hebrews. Because God's power was their salvation. Powerless slaves were spared the worst of the plagues. Powerless slaves walked out of Egypt of their own free will while the Egyptians showered them with gifts, gold and silver. The sea split. The army, the chariots and the riders and the horses all drowned beneath its waves. A pillar of cloud led them by day. A pillar of fire watched over them at night. Bitter water turned sweet. And a free people camped at the base of Mount Sinai. And there fire descended on the mountain. And the mountain shook. And the people heard God their Savior speak, I am the Lord. He is not a force. He is not an idea. He is not a philosophy or an ideology. He is not chance. He is not nature. Although he is the creator of all things and the author of all that is good, these things are not God. They are not a part of God. He dwells outside of them. He stands above them. God is a personal being. He has a name a name which he reveals to those whom he chooses. Adam and Eve knew his name. He revealed it to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. At the burning bush, he revealed his name and explained it once again to cowardly Moses. I am who I am. And now he speaks to the people at the foot of the mountain. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt. I am the God who chose to save you. I am the Lord. I am your Savior. Does he have your attention? He had theirs. You shall have no other gods beside me, before me, above me. You saw how powerless those gods were. You have a child's understanding of existence and being You have barely begun to discover the wonders of this world. You can't even imagine the vastness of this great universe. Do not think you can trust anything, even your own knowledge, your own discoveries, your own science above me. Do not attempt to minimize me, shrinking me, so that I can fit into your own imagination. Do not break my nature into bite-sized pieces, building little idols out of created things. Do not give my glory to another. You don't need other gods to whom you can properly relate. You have me. I am the Lord. Fear me. I am the Lord. I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God. I know what belongs to me. I will not tolerate you giving it to another, nor will I ever leave sin unpunished. Your sin will always come home to roost, and not only in your own lives. When you pass your sin down to your children and their children and their children, it will destroy them when they reject me and hate me. But as fierce as my anger against sin will be, so much greater will my grace be. If sin will fall to the third and fourth generation, a thousand generations will know my faithful love, my mercy, and my grace. They, and then they will live in that love. I am the Lord. This is who your God is. He is holy. He is just. He is gracious. He is the Lord your God. And now that you know his name, God says, 
now that you know my name, do not treat it as a trifle. Do not speak my name as a foolish exclamation. I will hold you accountable for all of your oaths. I will not tolerate those who rely on superstition or seek supernatural powers rather than calling on my name in faith. From creation, I establish a day of rest because I create, I provide. You will find all of your blessings, your greatest need, your highest good only in me. Your soul needs rest so your work can wait. Your bodies and your mind needs rest. Find your rest in me. The first and the last time Jesus brought his disciples up to the temple in Jerusalem came to the same result. Gentle Jesus turned over tables. He drove out the animals. He raged his anger was violent. Get these things out of here. This is not a place of business. And is it not written, my house will be called a house of prayer for all nations? But you have turned it into a den of robbers. You cannot help but notice when you read the Gospels that Jesus' harshest words, they aren't for the brutal Roman centurions, the cheating tax collectors, the prostitutes, or the other obvious sinners but for the religious leaders, the Pharisees, the scribes, and the priests, Jesus rebuked all sin. But only these sins drive him into a fury. We must learn what that means. No one can commit more terrible sins than these. They were abusing the place people went to meet with God. They were corrupting the way people thought of God. They were keeping people away from receiving the comfort and salvation that the Lord their God, their Savior, had prepared for them. A millstone tied around the, net, around the neck and going to sleep with the fishies was too good for those who would do such a thing, who would drive a soul away from the Lord. If by your words... If by your actions, if by our hypocritical standards, we keep people away from the Lord their God, will Jesus' fury not fall on us? You cannot put your soul in greater danger than if you do this to yourself. When the idols of money, of knowledge, of work, of even family, when you turn the gifts of God into God's, your soul suffers. When you tolerate false teaching, when the world's philosophies dominate your life, when the world's concerns fill your mind, when you treat God's word as if it, God's name as if it does not matter, and it slips from your lips without a thought, your soul suffers. When you dismiss the Lord's best gifts, when in untrusting busyness and upside-down priorities you neglect the Lord's house, when you seek your rest elsewhere, your soul suffers. The Lord your God is a jealous God. He desires your soul. Your false gods are powerless. Your false gods do not love you. They will not care for you. They cannot save you. And they will never satisfy you. So how can you let anything, anything, push the Lord your God out of your life for even a moment? We struggle to keep God in our lives. When we go searching for God on our own, we do not find him because we always look in the wrong places. Therefore, the Lord your God speaks. From Sinai, he says, I am the Lord your God who brought you up from the house of slavery. God does not wait for you to find him. He comes to find you. He comes to save you. The Lord your God 
comes to speak a greater word than Moses. From Calvary, the Lord your God speaks, Father, forgive them. And the one who kept every law, fulfilled every prophecy, he paid the price of your sin in his blood. He speaks, it is finished. He speaks, your sins are all forgiven. And your enemy, the devil, runs from him. The grave in vain tries to hold him. His, by his blood, your sin is blotted out forever. In Jesus, God speaks for all the world to hear. He speaks to you. He speaks for your heart. He says, I am your God. I am your Savior. There is no other except no substitutes. You have full access to him. You know his name. Pray, praise, and give thanks. You have his greatest gifts. Your Savior is your rest. And you receive his grace and blessing when he says to you, I am the Lord your God. For in Christ, all who call on the name of the Lord will be saved. It ought not surprise us that the God who would go through all of this to save his people and make them his own would also speak to them things that are for their good. And you can search all of philosophy. You can pour over every self-help book on the shelves and you will never find a better and more concise way to order your life for your own good and for the people around you than what we have before us today. The family is the center of all society. It is where children grow and where they are nursed. It's where they learn about their God and how to live according to his will, how to be forgiven and forgive. And so the Lord says, honor your father and mother so that you may enjoy many days in the land the Lord your God has given you. What is more precious than life itself? A gift from God. He gives you your body and your every breath for you to cherish and care for. He gives it to your neighbors, their time of grace to find the Lord and serve him. You shall not murder. If parents are needed for society, marriage must also be cherished. For no human relationship is deeper and more meaningful than that of marriage. The Lord takes two and he makes them into one flesh. God chooses marriage to be the own, his own beautiful picture of his own relationship with the church. You shall not commit adultery. We need stuff to live. And so God provides us with our abilities, the fruits of our labor. He provides the means for you to build and sustain your lives and to care for one another. Property is not a human construct. It is a gift of God. You shall not steal. Human are social creatures. We cannot live alone. We need the cooperation of the people around us. Life is better. We all benefit when we trust and when we are trusted. You shall not bear false testimony against your neighbor. Envious eyes erode the heart and corrupt our interactions. The love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. God has given you what you need for your good. And God gives your neighbor what he or she needs for her or his own good. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife, workers, donkey, or anything that belongs to your neighbor. It is impossible to deny the simplicity and the be perfect beauty of these commands. You don't need a study to show that by following these commands, you can set your life in good order. And that when you get these commands out of order, things start to fall apart. When your eyes search for what other people have, when you seek after your reputation first, when, you, when people are stealing and looking for the property of others, when your life is put ahead of those people God has placed into your put into your life for your care, we see how everything begins to fall apart. You can't help but notice, in these words, you can really live, you can really flourish. 
These are simple and beautiful instructions, and yet no one keeps them. We find our little loopholes, our ways around them. We dismiss them, we ignore them, and then we have the audacity to blame God when things do not go well for us. God sets the standard for a good life, and we barely try. His law is beautiful. Its truth sets us free to live our best lives. But we see it as a cage, a chain that is holding us back. We break the law and then complain that God is too harsh, that he holds us accountable for the evil we have done and the damage our sin causes. If we cannot even follow God's simplest instructions, why should he even bother with us at all? And yet, and yet, God knew our hearts are too hard. He knew our heads are too thick. He knew we are too stiff-necked. And so, even as he handed down this beautiful law written on tablets of stone, he also established a tabernacle, a temple, anointed priests to intercede on behalf of the people. The sacrifices to teach them that even though they sinned, God still desired to forgive them and be their God. God still reminded them again and again, he had a plan to save them. He had a plan to save you. God speaks his law for your good. But if we had to find our way to God through the law, even the simplest law who would make it, even with the temple, its pillars and its gates and its altars, God's people couldn't even come close to getting it together, to finding their way to God. How frustrating it must have been for Jesus to walk into the temple and to see it full of greed. So, Jesus made a new promise. Jesus would make a new way. Even as he was rebuking those who, were, who didn't believe, Jesus established a new temple, a new place to meet with God, a new sacrifice for sins. In Jesus, God had come down to intercede for his people. But we even rejected him. Our sin destroyed the temple of his body. But God used that for the most beautiful thing of all. As he breathed his last, God tore the temple curtain in two. And Jesus rose again on the third day to declare that you have a new way to God. We do not meet God at Sinai. We do not approach the Lord through the law. We do not offer new sacrifices at some earthly temple. Instead, the Lord, your God and Savior, is your God and Savior through his one and only Son. He forgives your sin. He renews your heart. He repairs what your sin has broken and he clothes you with his robe of righteousness. And in Christ, God rejoices to say once again, I am the Lord, your God. You can pick any team you want. Some teams might perform better than others in the short term, but no team is really better than the other. However, when we lift up our eyes to consider the greatest aspirations of the human heart, There is only one team. No other can even step onto the field. Only one God reigns over all things. And in Jesus, you know his name. In Jesus, he has chosen you for salvation. In Jesus, God is the God who saves. Your God is the God who cares. Your God is the God who shapes your life. Your God is the one who comes down to you, not just in the fire of Sinai and instructions on how to live, but your God comes to you in a manger in Bethlehem, in the wilderness of Judea as Satan does his worst, in every interaction with hurting people, on the cross of Calvary and from the empty tomb. Your God is the God who saves you. He has called you. He has remade your heart. He has given you new clothes to wear. He will reshape your life. How blessed are you that he has chosen you to be on his team, both now and forevermore. Amen. Please rise.
And now the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. You may be seated as we sing the next five verses, verses 6 through 10, of salvation unto us has come. worship the Lord with our offerings. While the offering is being gathered, if you have any prayer requests, you can fill out a green prayer request card or text that to my cell phone number.
Please rise for prayer. Lord, our rock and our redeemer, may the words of our mouths and the meditation of our hearts be pleasing in your sight. Your word is a lamp for our feet. Your word is a light for our path. Your commandments are perfect, trustworthy, right, and pure. Rule in our hearts, and let your kingdom come among us as we hear, learn, and do your will. Your word is a lamp to our feet. Your word is a light to our path. Your gospel seems like foolishness to those who are perishing. Still, let your word go out to people near and far, and reveal to them your true wisdom, and bring the wisdom of the world to nothing. Your word is a lamp to our feet. Your word is a light to our path. Look in all the schools of our land and bless those who teach and those who learn, that they may grow in true knowledge, wisdom, and skill as they learn about the wonders of your world. Your word is a lamp to our feet. Your word is a light to our path. Let the zeal for your house consume us, that we love your house and the message that is proclaimed here. Renew us daily with the message of your love as the foundation for our faith and life. Your word is a lamp to our feet. Your word is a light on our path. Let your perfect word refresh the souls who are suffering, dealing with pain, loss, or illness. We especially pray on behalf of your dear daughter, Laura Zenk, as she is recovering from treatments for her cancer. Be with her to strengthen her and comfort her and ease her pain. Remind her of your love and your care and your eternal plans for her eternal good. We place her into your hands, dear Lord. We also pray that you would be with our, your dear daughter, Liz, as she is continuing to deal with severe back pain. Grant her relief from her pain that she may rejoice in the love that you have for her and serve you all the days of her life. Heal their diseases and make all things work together for their good as you have promised. Your word is a lamp for our feet. Your word is a light on our path. Hear us, Lord, as we bring you our private petitions. O Lord, our God, enlighten our meditations that we may hear and understand your life-giving and divine commands. Through your grace and mercy, assure us of your love, hope, and salvation of body and soul. And we shall sing your everlasting glory forever. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And we say the prayer he has taught us. <coughs> our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give him thanks and praise. It is truly good and right that we should at all times and in all places Give you thanks, O Lord, Holy Father, almighty and everlasting God, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who brought the gift of salvation to all people by his death on the tree of the cross, so that the devil, who overcame us by a tree, would in turn by a tree be overcome. Therefore, with all the saints on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your holy name and join their glorious song.
Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Then he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. And the peace of the Lord be with you always. Amen. Amen.
given it to death for the forgiveness of all your sins. Take and eat the body of Christ.
Lord, for he is good. His mercy endures forever. Whenever we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. We give thanks, Almighty God, that you have refreshed us with this saving gift. We pray that through it you will strengthen our faith in you and increase our love for one another. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Amen. You may be seated for our closing hymn. Thank you. Good morning again. What a pleasure and blessing to worship with all of you today. I do believe the announcements are in your service folder. I will just note that we will continue our Lenten services at 6.30 on Wednesday nights and also there's a dinner beforehand and you have to listen to me again on Wednesday here. So with that, the Lord be with you until we meet again.